Great, okay, well, lovely to see you all here. What a lovely packed room. My name is Suzanne Savage, and I've done a project called Coaching Into Action, and it's all about supporting concrete improvements in teaching, learning, and assessment. I will say that this is a work in progress. So some of the findings, it's really a two-year project. So we're only six months into the first year. So a lot of this is a preliminary flavor for what's going on. Um, the first thing, you all probably know that <coughs> effective teachers are reflective practitioners. This is something that's a really key part of our profession. And it's interesting that it's actually the first um, of the new professional standards on reflect on what works best in your teaching. We're also told that reflective thinking actively challenges the comfortable, taken for granted part of our professional selves. That's what good reflection does. It gets us doing something. You're probably all familiar with different reflective cycles, but they all end up in something to do with action. It's not just reflection to reflect, but we're going to do something with it. And so my project is about the action planning part of that, the actual getting around to doing something. So what we've done, we started off at my college with an action plan policy that was prescribed by ELSIS, might be familiar to many of you. It was kind of the flavor for a while of what was happening. A teacher would be observed yearly as a part of an internal review. Some people refer to that pejoratively as a mock stead shall we say. Um, the observer would then identify areas of development from that session. The teacher would put these into an action plan and the action plan would be reviewed at the next observation. So this is what we had been doing since 2012 when Elsa had come out to work with us. But we found some issues with that current policy. In 2013-14, only 40% of people returned them. And our Board of Governors was not very happy about it. And they said, we need more action plans. <laughs> our data doesn't look good. We're supposed to have them and we're 40% down. So they said, go out and get us some action plans. But when we started to reflect on this, we realized that there were a lot of other problems with this policy. That the action plan was really driven by the observer. The staff had absolutely no ownership in it. It was done to them. Here is your action plan. And as many uh, researchers have shown, the, the, the nature of what happens in an observed session isn't necessarily how that person normally teaches. But this is done to them. And HR people tell us that if, unless the development plan has complete commitment and buy-in from the individual, nothing is likely to happen. As I was alluding to, the observations are episodic, meaning it's one hour of a teacher who's probably teaching 840 hours a year. So the resulting actions given to them couldn't represent the whole of the practice of what they really needed to improve on. And there were so few plans returned at my college, nobody was even bothering to do yearly reviews. So we had a big issue here, more than just governors wanting you know, 60 or 65% return rates. We saw this as a real opportunity, a time for change. We had a mandate from the Board of Governors, and it was a chance to promote teacher reflection and personal development in a different way. So what we did is every member of staff, after their observation, sat down with a teaching and learning coach to formulate their action plan. So this was hoping that it was an action plan that they would have more ownership of, and that possibly maybe even had a chance of being implemented. So the research, uh, the, the approach we used, sorry, was a solution-focused coaching model. There's lots of different coaching models out here. But for action planning, it's a particularly good one. It's very result-focused. It's all about facilitating self-directed learning and implementing changes. And we felt that this was really suitable for identifying improvements in teaching and learning and putting them into the action plans. So we asked these questions then when we did our research. First of all, can we make the governors happy? Will more teachers complete their action plans? But really important for us, will they formulate better quality targets which are focused on the real teaching and learning improvements that they need in their practice? And thirdly, will that action plan then cascade into something different in the classroom itself? So those were the key questions we set out to do. I'm happy to say 
Um, we chose a mixed methodology, uh, which you're probably all familiar with. I won't go into it too much. We had some key quantitative measures, obviously number of action plans completed, but we also want to look at next year how many of the action items actually were done. And did that have any correlation with any of the key performance indicators like student achievement, uh, retention, success rates, things like that. And that we won't know till next year. But for us as coaches, the qualitative stuff is the really rich stuff. And we had questionnaires that we were doing. Um, we want the teachers to evaluate the impact of their practice through the questionnaires and through focus groups. We wanted to really try out a focus group approach, which can also start a community of practice and joint practice development, which we were keen to support as well. So the governors are happy. We got more action plans. <laughs> yeah? So I get to continue working. Yeah? We are currently at 75%. We've only been doing this for six months. And if I weren't here today, I'd have two people I would be doing action plans with. <laughs> They've been put off till tomorrow morning. So that number's gonna go up completely. So my governors are happy. But more than that, we've had so much has come out of this project. We are so thrilled that we did it. First of all, the quality of smart targets has really improved. This is a sample of what we had before. I've, cut and, I've just copied and pasted this. To take part in a knowledge quiz before the practical starts as a starting point. I, I don't know. I just did this. I, to me, this seems like something maybe the students do. This is supposed to be a teacher's action plan. This was about the best. Ensure regular embedding of E&D. But those of you who do smart target setting know this isn't really quite cutting the mustard. Yeah? A couple of samples that I randomly chose. Something like this. Prepare three stretching questions to use in each lesson. This has been really effective with one of our maths tutors who couldn't do open questioning. She now pre-prepares them. It's working brilliantly. Yeah? Attend the Education and Training Foundation's English Enhancement course next year, which we're thinking is going to run. <laughs> so hopefully that'll be an action point. So you can see how much more targeted, how much easier it's going to be to follow up. And from this one, obviously, we'll have to see where they go from there once they've attended that. So it will feed forward. What we've also found is that this coaching investment really made our staff feel extremely valued. They said, being noticed, having an action plan, made me think the college is interested in me. I actually had people in my sessions break down in tears. They were so happy that somebody wanted to talk to them about where they were going as a teacher and how they could improve. It was really, really moving. We were also, because we had this dialogue going on with the coaches, there were sometimes developmental needs that we could meet straight away. We had resources at our fingertips. We could put uh, people with good practice together. We could refer them to others. We could give them a book. We have an activity. All sorts of different things. So we actually met a lot of action plan needs right then and there in that coaching session. But further than that, a lot of teachers self-referred for coaching. And normally, our job had been to work with grade three and four lecturers. So the grade twos and the grade ones weren't coming to us. But they did have to come to us to have this action plan discussion. And even I sat down with several grade one tutors and came up with some really good coaching sessions, three or four sessions on specific things they wanted to try out. So we reached out and we're talking about improving teaching learning across the college. As a result of that, we identified a lot of team support needs. So we were able to do much more targeted CPD instead of the sort of generic cross college thing, which we have to do a lot of. This was, hey, we've got this need. This is specifically what we're going to do. So it was much more differentiated. So it, it's just been fantastic. It's been a heck of a lot of work. We're all sort of reeling from it. Um, but one little case study I just wanted to briefly share with you was about a team leader who, while making her action plan, we've all heard it before, oh, there's so much to do, there's so much paperwork, I, I can't think about improving my practice because I've just got too much to do. And we used coaching questions, which are ways to get people to reflect. I'd, I'd, I'd love to do a whole separate session on coaching questions if you don't know what it is, but they're these reflective things. And it turned out that she's doing hours and hours of work for the rest of the people on her team because they don't know how to do it. So through coaching questions again, she realized that she needed a team CPD to meet their needs. And so we put that in three weeks later, 
The result, the team leader has earned herself four or five hours a week of spare time. The others are a lot more effective and they're less dependent upon her. They're more professional in themselves. I don't, this, this woman has been doing this for at least five years that I know of. I don't know when this would have been found out if we didn't have that safe and supportive one-to-one -one coaching session. So that's just one example of how it worked. A little tip for all of you who think about doing focus groups. We've done one focus group so far. Most coaches find, when I've talked with my colleagues, that it can be difficult to get people to come to these things because we're all so busy. So we have a plan. We took 50 quid from the RDF bursary and we catered them to lunch. Mm -hmm. And instead of five people coming, we got 25 people. Mm -hmm. And suddenly we had a really dynamic group who were really, really keen. And they went on and on about how much it made them feel valued. 50 quid. You know, how much are you paying on motivational speakers to come in for an hour? We just opened up a bunch of packages of cheese and ham and, and bread and they made their own sandwiches and spent an hour talking about teaching and learning and their own development and they want to do it again. So the lesson is eating is a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> um, what for me I'm most passionate about about this whole process is this has prompted a whole change in our lesson observation. We found out that there was widespread dissatisfaction with the internal reviews. Because these coaching conversations happened after the observations, we found out how unhappy people were with them. And when we fed this back, it started a whole broad discussion within the observation team about the purpose of our observations and what we're trying to achieve. So the entire observation policy is now under revision, and what they want it to be is less inspection, more development, which for me as a coach, is the best thing I could have gotten to. Um, and so that's really going to have huge knock-on effects next year. I'm, 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 I'm rewriting the policy this summer, so uh, if, I could, if I weren't doing this research carrying on next year, I'd do another RDF on what's going to happen with this, because I think it's a fascinating thing. Um, challenges that we found. Not everybody wanted to meet with us. <laughs> Lots of people did. Uh, there was a solid core that didn't want to. One said, I don't need a form to improve. I was going to do all this anyway. Others said, oh, it's just a bureaucratic thing and nobody ever does anything anyway. So we have a group of people who we're probably not going to reach. Um, our initial coaching conversations were so dominated by the dissatisfaction with observations that it was hard to get over that barrier and talk about their professional development. It was all about the observation and sometimes that was very, very hard work for us. Um, and following on from that, what the focus group said is, you know, observations are happening mid-year but that's not when we want to be planning. We would really like to plan at a different time. So those are the things we came up against. Oh, and this was the other thing. Some of the line managers thought they should be in charge of this because it was like a performance review. And why were the coaches doing this? That was very dodgy. So those were the, the obstacles we had. Um, but the conclusion that we've drawn, if we go back to our first question, will more teachers complete action plans? Absolutely. We had a 60% increase in returns. Hmm? Will teachers formulate better um, quality action items? Absolutely. Will these result in improved classroom practice? I don't yet know. Ask me next year. <laughs> yeah, that's for the next part of it. So my recommendations for you, if you're thinking about doing something like this, is that the action plans should be focused on professional development and they sit in the coaching process. This is different from performance reviews by line managers. And a lot of research shows us this. Here we have, while well, targets help to focus attention, they rarely act as a means for improving. You need to see coaching as a creative lever and not as an accountability tool. It's one of the reasons that we coaches aren't part of the observation team. We do supportive observations, but we want to have that safe space where we're not wagging your finger for what you haven't done. We're the enabler, the facilitator. So that is a key thing if you're thinking about doing this kind of model, to keep that in mind. Um, another thing, what we decided on the timing of action planning based upon feedback, A, we needed to decouple it from the observation. 
If we wanted them to authentically think about their own practice, then it couldn't be triggered by that observation event. So the time to do it is at the beginning of the academic year, and then to do a review midway and see how they're getting on with it, see what further support they need. The other thing, which I've mentioned before, on focus groups, they're fantastic. It's a great way to bring staff together, bring food. Um, and a couple of questions to leave you because I'm 19 seconds over. Should staff be required to meet with a coach? What if they don't want to? If we had optional meetings, would we have had such a success rate? I don't know. And the last one, which I really want to leave you with, is do teachers actually possess effective action planning skills? We found a lot of them were weak. Fully qualified teachers were quite weak. And it's interesting, Matt O'Leary says, it cannot be taken for granted that all teachers will naturally develop reflective skills simply as a result of gaining more teaching experience. And that's where the coach can come in and facilitate that development. I think it can. I think line managers are a bit confused still, so I think you're absolutely right. I think the idea is, is that action planning about your practice is about your professionalism, about what you're wanting to do, what you're identifying as your developmental needs. And that's different from a target that you've been set by your line manager, that you need to have this success rate, that you need to bring that in. That's an accountability tool for performance management which is different from a developmental tool that's just about improving your practice. And so I think that those are ideally separated, although indeed a bit difficult to juggle, admittedly. I think if you separate them, then teachers are free to explore without the punitive measures of the performance with it. Just one more question. Apart from developmental observation, because a lot of what you've said, um, there are similarities in my approach. But so apart from the development observations, do you do any other sort? Because we do a few observations, and I think our staff find those uh, more productive with a view to, you know, uh, wanting to improve what they do. Um, so what else do you do apart from that? Nominally, we have peer observations, but they haven't been very well promoted. And so in my rewrite of the, of the lesson observation policy, I'm going to put a lot more of that in, because I think, again, that takes that performative thing off the observation and makes it developmental when it's the peer review. So I think it's a fantastic idea. So our, our experience really shows that. Your job as a coach, are you a line manager as well? Then? Nope. Are targets are set through our appraisal system. Absolutely. So, but this is just about you becoming a better teacher. It's not about anybody saying, oh, you didn't do it, therefore we're going to put you under performance management. Right, yeah. Sorry to cut you short there, but thank you so much. Sorry, Thanks yeah. Again, Suzanne, thank You're you welcome. Very much. I'll pass around. I've got all the slides, which you can take a copy. I think I've got enough for everybody. So, thank you very much. Thank you.